we're doing the uh, 2020 uh, A-level biology paper. So, the iris in the human eye is a muscular structure. The iris changes the size of the pupil. And here we have the muscles. So we've got the radial muscle here. The circular muscle is this circular stuff there. The pupil here, and this whole thing is the this this thing here is the iris. Suggest hand explain how the interaction between the muscles labeled in figure one can cause the pupil to constrict or narrow. So what this is trying to test you on is your appreciation of muscles can you know working antagonistically, meaning that as one contracts, the other sort of um, relaxes. So if we imagine your arm here, and this is your hand, this is your biceps muscle, this is your triceps muscle. So as the biceps contracts as so, the triceps relaxes, allowing it to sort of move up. Because if they both contracted, you would just stay stuck there. So we need to figure out which one's contracting and which, which one's relaxing, and this takes a bit of imagination. The goal here is to make the pupil, this gray thing, bigger. And we can see that these, uh, these radial muscles are attached to it like this. So if we pull this way, as in if they, sh if they contract, then this will cause the pupil to enlarge. So that must mean the circular muscles have to relax. So if we look here, we can see that the radial muscles are attached to the pupil like so. If these were to, if these were to contract, then this would obviously shorten and it would pull on the pupil and make it larger. So therefore, this must relax. So, it, because if it contracts, it would make the pupil bigger. So that must mean the circular muscles are contracting instead. So you would say here, the circular muscles uh, sorry, circular muscles contract, excuse my handwriting, and the radial muscles relax. Right, then the next question then says, the fovea of the eye of an eagle has a high density of cones. An eagle focuses the image of its prey onto the fovea. Explain how the fovea enables an eagle to see its prey in detail. Do not talk about color vision in this answer. And you'd be surprised how many people then proceed to start unloading information about colored vision in the answer. It's talking about a density of cones. The question's alluded to the fact that these cones must contribute to the fact that you can see the prey in more detail. Because it says the fovea's got loads of cones, fovea lets you see more detail. So this cones obviously has to play a role. So with rods and cones, so let's say, let's say the, this is a rod, this is a rod, and this is a rod, and this is a bipolar neuron which I'm going to abbreviate as BN. This is a cone, and this is a bipolar neuron, and this is a cone, and a bipolar neuron. So you guys should know that a cone synapses with its own bipolar neuron, but multiple rods synapse with one bipolar neuron. Now, why is this important? It's because if, if light hits the retina, then the, let's say, let's say this is one unit, this is one unit, and this is one unit. And to stimulate this bipolar neuron to send an action potential, you need two units. If you have multiple rods connecting to one bipolar neuron, the sum of all of these generator potentials add up and can lead to an action potential being sent through this bipolar neuron, which makes them sensitive. They're really, really good at detecting the presence of light to begin with. So again, like you might have like a very low level of light that one singular rod might not trigger an action potential in, but because all three of them add up, it triggers an action potential, a signal sent to your brain, and your brain says, oh, there's light there making these very sensitive. Now the issue here though, is that they're not very good with acuity. So acuity is being able to tell apart two very close points. It's similar to resolution. And they're quite rubbish at it because imagine we have, imagine you, see, so imagine this is what your brain sees, okay? So your brain sees whatever's underneath here. Imagine you have two spots here. Your brain is gonna see a merging of these two spots. So your brain sees this. Because these, because of the fact that multiple rods join one bipolar neuron, whereas if we have cones, these cones pick up this dot as two distinct features, two distinct spots. So the acuity of cones is higher. So your brain sees the two dots. Now, so that means in summary, cones have a higher acuity, but they have a lower sensitivity because they don't add up their um, they don't add up their generator potentials because multiple you know each cone has its own bipolar neuron. So there's a trade-off for that for the, at the expense of better visual acuity. So the reason that there's so many in the fovea is because you want to be able to have loads of visual acuity. You want to have a high visual acuity so you can see the prey in detail. So here you need to appreciate that fact. So you need to say that cones have a high visual acuity. So, and we need to explain why. If we just say they have a high visual acuity, that's not enough detail. It's like you asking me why a car is good, and I say, well, a car has four wheels. 
it doesn't really explain the fact that the car can be used to travel from point A to B, etc. using those four wheels. So here we need to explain why the visual acuity is so. It is because each cone is connected to its own bipolar neuron. Okay, and then why is that important? Because each cone is connected to its own bipolar neuron, cones send separate impulses to the brain. Each, each cone sends its own impulse directly to the brain, because bipolar neurons go to the brain. Whereas a rod here doesn't send a separate impulse to us, this rod here. They both are bunched together and sent to the brain as one. So that's why we have a high visual acuity. It's because of these two features. So the one that I'm about to write down is each cone whoops, sends a separate, and don't just say signal, you have to say impulse. Impulse to the brain. When we're talking about nervous system impulses, action potentials, blah, 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 you never, ever, ever say signals because it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a rubbish term. You need to use the word impulse because it's, it's articulating the fact that you understand that there is a electrical signal being sent from these, uh, you know, from the receptor to the, you know, to the brain. So that's important. You can say action potential here as well, but that's what you would have to say in this question. So the retina of the human eye has an area of this, you know, 1.094 times 10 to the 3 millimeters squared. The circular fovea in the human eye has a diameter of 3 times 10 to the 3 micrometers. Calculate the area of the fovea as a percentage of the area of the retina. The area of a circle is pi r squared, and it says to use this in your answer. So I'm going to quickly look for my calculator. So area of fovea. So we need to put fovea over retina's area, and then times it by 100. So we've got the air, we've got the little area of the retina here, which is that. We need to find the area of a fovea. When we do this kind of calculation, you need to make sure the units are the same. So we've got 3 times 10 to the 3 micrometers. That would become 3 millimeters, because for every millimeter, there's a 1,000 micrometers. So therefore, we need to now work out this area. So the area would equal pi times r squared. Now they told you the diameter is three, so the actual, the radius is half of that. So it's gonna be 1.5 squared times pi, which in this case is 3.14. And that gives us 1.5 squared, oh, what? 1.5 squared times 3.14, which gives us 7.065. So now we work out the percentage, so that would be 7.065, because we've now made the units the same. 1.094 times 10 to the 3, so 1.094 times 10 to the 3, times 100, giving us 0 0.645, 0 0.645, which is roughly 0 0.6. So, the retina of an owl has a high density of rod cells. Explain how this enables an owl to hunt its prey at night. Do not refer to rhodopsin in your answer. So, just like I mentioned before, loads and loads of rods are synapsing on the same bipolar neuron. So, again, I'm making this up. Let's say we need two impulses, two units of impulse to stimulate this bipolar neuron to send a signal to the brain. Then one rod alone isn't going to do it because it's one and two is needed. But two rods is enough to do it and three and so on. So that's what we're trying to get and that's sensitivity. So what would you say here? You would need to say that the rods have high sensitivity. Why is that? It's because multiple rods join to one bipolar neuron. That still doesn't explain though. This is like saying a car is good for moving because a car has four wheels. It doesn't really explain the next part of how it actually starts moving. The four wheels allow it to move. The engine does it, whatever, right? So in this case, they're, um, they release enough neurotransmitter to um to uh to overcome the threshold for an action potential i'm going to write ap for short but you guys write action potential you can also say spatial summation because it is an application of spatial summation so these rods will release lots and lots of neurotransmitter onto this bipolar neuron but because there's three of them, three lots of that neurotransmitter is going to add up, giving you spatial summation. Um, the uh, Spatial summation is the additive effect of the neurotransmitters being released from multiple neurons onto one singular one. So that's how you would get that answer. Right.
So, testosterone then. So testosterone is a steroid hormone that belongs to a group of male sex hormones called androgens. Steroid hormones are hydrophobic. Explain why steroid hormones can rapidly enter a cell by passing through its cell surface membrane. Generally in biology, things that are hydrophobic are lipid soluble. So the first thing you would say here is that because it's lipid soluble, it can just go straight through. So, you know, they are lipid soluble. But now, as I've said, as I always bang on, whenever you're talking about the movement of things, you always need to talk about, first of all, there's a diffusion, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, osmosis, from a high concentration to a low concentration, and what is it actually moving through? So they're lipid soluble, so they diffuse through, and what are we, what are we going through? It's the cell surface membrane. We need to clarify what we're going through. It's diffusing through the phospholipid bilayer. If you, if you say all of those things that I've mentioned, you'll guarantee, it'll guarantee you marks every single time you have a question to do with this stuff. Right, so in the cytoplasm, testosterone binds to a specific androgen receptor, AR, and this is a protein. Suggest and explain why it binds to a specific AR. So this is something that you should just know off the bat. It is because it has a specific tertiary, whoops, tertiary structure. And it's, it's, you know, it's complementary, sorry, you know, it's complementary to that AR, basically. So, you know, you've got this androgen receptor here that might look like this. The shape of this testosterone is so specific and it fits into, you know, the, that, the, um, the specific androgen receptor. Let's say I have a different androgen receptor here. It wouldn't work because they're not complementary. So next. The binding of testosterone to an AR changes the shape of the AR. This AR molecule now enters the nucleus and stimulates gene expression. Suggest how the AR can stimulate gene expression. So what this is, is testing your knowledge on transcription factors. So the way that all transcription factors generally work in A-level biology is, well, first of all, you can they work by binding to, a DN, binding to DNA at a pr promoter region, and that stimulates RNA polymerase to make mRNA. So you would say here that um, the AR binds to a promoter region on DNA, and this stimulates <clears throat> RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is, a, is essential for a gene to be expressed, without it won't do it because you need to make you know, the mRNA copy and you need to you know, translate it and so on. So the gene that codes for the AR has a variable number of CAG repeats. Some studies have shown an association between the number of CAG repeats and the risk of developing prostate cancer. Fig table 1 shows the results of a statistical test from one study. What can you conclude is another way of saying evaluate. So you need to say what things you can see there what and you know what their relevance is. Remember with your p-value, if it's less than 0 0.05, then it is significant. If it's not, then it isn't. So with all of these, your best bet is to comment on what's significant and what's not. With less than 16 repeats, the association is significant. Why? Because the probability of it being due to chance is less than 0 0.05. If I flip a coin 10 times, you would expect that half of them would be heads and half would be tails. That's your expectation. But by chance, I might get all 10 of them to be heads, or by chance, it might be, you know, none of them are heads. So that's what chance really is here. If we did this experiment, it might be by chance that there's an association, which is why we use these p-values to say, okay, there is actually something going on here. There is a link. It's not just, you know, we got lucky in a way. So there's that. <clears throat> and saying that will guarantee you a good amount of marks in the mark scheme. We'll look in this question. We'll look at the mark scheme right after and see what it would have said. Now, like I said before, let's comment on what's not significant. So now if we look at with 17 or less repeats, you can see that the p-value is pretty high. So it's, pro it's, you know, it's not significant. So with um, 17 or less repeats, the association is not significant because its p-value is greater than, <coughs> excuse me, whoops, I got them the wrong way around, greater than 0 0.05. Now, let's see what this mark scheme says then. So the mark scheme says one mark for, 16 repeats, the association is significant. There's one mark for saying that 17 repeats, the association is not significant. And then the one, the other, another mark is given for the fact that you've said the probability of it being due to chance is less than 0 
you need to make sure that you phrase this stuff correctly. You, you can't say just the results are significant. It doesn't show the examiner you know what significance means. They're t what they're testing is that there's an if there's an association, there's a link between the K CAG repeats and prostate cancer. So you saying the results are significant doesn't mean anything. It's like me saying, like for example with the car example, it's like let's say I have a white car, it's like you pointing out the car is a mass that's white. It provides literally zero information. So here, what they're testing is the link between CAG repeats and prostate cancer, a possible link. So you need to say that that link, that possible link or association is significant, not just the results are significant. It's a cop-out answer and they won't give you the marks. This figure two shows one type of calorimeter. So we've got a thermometer in here, we've got a stirrer, some water, a sample holder, and you know, all of that kind of jazz. We've got that out here, there. So a calorimeter can be used to determine the chemical energy store of biomass. A known mass of biomass is fully combusted in a calorimeter. The heat energy released from this combustion increases the temperature of the water in the calorimeter. Uh, the increase in temperature of a known volume of water is recorded. Other than the thermometer, explain how two features of the calorimeter shown in figure two would enable a valid measurement of the total heat energy released. So you need to look at the figure, which is what surprisingly people don't do, and say what's good about it. They've got a stirrer here. So if you're stirring and then all the heat's going to be distributed pretty evenly. So you can say that. What else can you say? What about this air here, this rim of air? It'll stop heat escaping. So those are things that make the experiment more valid. The results are reliable, they're good. So the stirrer distributes heat evenly. There's a reason they give you these figures. A lot of people just don't look at it and just try and come up with some conclusion. It's like, no, you don't, don't do that. And also the um, air acts as an insulator and reduces heat loss. Because ideally, to make this to make this experiment perfect, we need all of the heat to go into the water only, and that's it. So, a two gram sample of biomass is fully combusted in a calorimeter. The volume of water in the calorimeter is 100 centimeters cubed. The increase in temperature is 15.7 degrees. 4.18 joules of energy is needed to increase uh, one centimeter cubed of water by one degree Celsius. Use this information to calculate the energy released in kilojoules per gram of biomass. So this question is absolutely horrendous for those that don't do chemistry. Um, there's multiple ways of going around this. Now, what you need to look at is you need to try and work. I like to work around with units to make sense of this. So 4.18 joules per centimeter cubed per degree Celsius. That's what the units of this thing is. So you need to just mess with the units till it works out, basically. So... We want to, we, if we multiply this by something in centimeters cubed and something in Celsius, then we get a unit in joules. So we got the energy release part. So you would do 4.18, 4.18 times the volume of water heated, which is 100, times the temperature change, which they've given you is 15.7. Now for my chemistry heads out there, you'll recognize that as Q equals dem C delta T. So then if you do that in your calculator, you get 4.18 times 100 times 15.7, gives you 6562.6 and because we've times it by something in centimeters cubed that unit gets knocked off and then if you times it by something in celsius degree celsius that also disappears so you're left with something in joules now the answer wants something in kilojoules per gram so you need to convert this to kilojoules so that's just 6.562 6 kilojoules so then what we need to do is we need to make this a kilojoules per gram so they've told you it's a two gram sample so you divide your answer by two and that should give you the correct answer. So if we divide that by two, you get 3.2813 kilojoules per gram. So you can just leave it as 3.28 or 3.3. There you go. Plants and algae produce fuels called biofuels. Scientists who use Corella to produce biofuel. Corella is a genus of a single cell photosynthetic alga. Corella can be grown in open ponds and fermenters. In natural ecosystems, most of the light falling is not used in photosynthesis. Suggest why. First of all, one of the most obvious things is that, you know, you have for photosynthesis to work, you have to assume that the light actually hits the right part. Light might not actually hit the chlorophyll. So light misses the chlorophyll. Another thing as well is that for all my physics heads out there, you'll know that if you absorb all light, you're left with black. Plants are green. Well, a lot of them are different colors. So the reason those plants are those colors is because they reflect those wavelengths of light. So green isn't absorbed by plants. They reflect it. So, you know, that's why they're green. So light is reflected. Not even just that, but other things you can say is that photosynthesis, the chlorophyll requires specific wavelengths. 
If you have the wrong wavelength of light, then it's not going to be absorbed and then it doesn't work. Also, if I use something like, you know, straight up gamma rays as well, that probably wouldn't work. So it's just things like that. Also, you could mention as well, it might be that, you know, you have CO2 concentration as a limiting factor or temperature. So it doesn't matter how much light you use. The fact that there's not enough concentrate CO2 or the temperature is not good enough is stopping photosynthesis from being able to carry out its thing. But I think that's a riskier answer to say. In this case, pretty much saying this is fine. The light absorbed by chlorophyll is used in a light-dependent reaction. Name two products of the light-dependent reaction that are required for the light-independent reaction. So it's ATP and reduced NADP. Those are the two main, major, major things that are needed. And unfortunately, it's just something you just got to sit and memorize. So next, Corella cells could divide rapidly. A culture of 2,000 Corella cells are set up in a fermenter. The cells divided every 90 minutes. You can assume there were no limiting factors and no cells died during the 24 hours. Calculate the number of cells in the culture after 24 hours. So they double every 90 minutes. So we need to work out how many doubles basically happen. So what we can do is we can do 24 times 60 to give us how many minutes are in this day. So 24 times 60 is 1440 minutes. So we can work out the number of divisions, which would be 1440 over 90, because it's every 90 minutes, giving us 16 divisions. So now we st we're starting off with 2000. After 90 minutes, it's going to double. After the next 90 minutes, it's going to double again, and so on. So what you can straight up just do is you can just do 2 to the 16, because you're timesing it by 2 16 times. If you do that, we get, let's have a look, 2,000 times 2 to the 16. It gives us 1.31072 times 10 to the 8. And again, don't stress out on calculation questions too much, because it's just two marks. Like, you're better off writing a nice, chunky, fat, correct answer for something else. Let's have a look what's going on here. So figure three shows the banding pattern of a single sarcomere. So explain the banding pattern. Okay, the way I like to remember this is I band is light and it only has actin in it. Only. So the next thing is the H zone. Unfortunately, I can't think of a quirky way to remember this is it's only myosin. And the darkest part is where actin and myosin are both present. The darkest parts are actin and myosin. There you go. That's how you do that. Creatinins produce the muscle tissues. Creatinin diffuses into the blood. The kidneys then excrete creatinin. A calibration curve can be used to determine the concentration of creatinin in urine. One method of producing a calibration curve needs a creatinin solution of known concentration, distilled water, creatinin detecting solution, and a colorimeter. Creatinin detecting solution reacts with creatinine to produce an orange color. So how can we produce a calibration curve? So if we have loads and loads and loads of creatinine, you're going to get a very, very, very orange looking solution. If you have a teeny bit, it's going to look slightly orange. So what we can do is we can create a dilution series because we have known concentrations. So what you do is you add distilled water to um, creatinine solution to create a dilution series. So what this might mean is that I have some in, some here and then I make another one, take half of the first in here and then fill it up halfway and then add half water and then so on and so on to get it. This means that I have known concentrations of creatinine. Then what I can do is you add, you have to obviously make it go orange so what, what I've got here is, let's say there's loads of, cre let's, I'm going to make up units here, just made up numbers. So I've got all these tubes here that don't look like tu very good tubes. Let's say this is one, you know, mole per decimeter cube. This is a 0 0.5, this is 0 0.25, this is 0 0.125. Obviously, I'm just going to have a clear liquid in all of these. So I need to be able to actually see, you know, which one's the darkest. So I have the creatinine detecting solution, and this goes really dark. This goes kind of dark. This is not very dark, and that's quite pale. So you need to add the creatinine detecting solution to each tube. Next, the we need to record the absorbance of these known solutions. So what you do is you use the colorimeter to record the absorbance of each, uh, e e you know, each um, solution. Because then, let's say I'm going to make this up. Let's say, I don't know, we have like 10 um, you know, 10, 5, uh, 2.5, 1.25. These are just completely made up like readings. 
Then you can make a calibration curve. You know your concentrations because you've made these solutions of 0 0.125, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and then you know one. This would be your concentration. This would be your absorbance. We'll like, ignore the handwriting, and you know that might be like what 1.25, 2.5, etc., and 10. So you would see that it would make you know some sort of curve like this or something. So you've made this curve based on the results that you found from known solution. So now what you do is you plot the um, absorbance of each solution against their concentration on a graph. Excuse my handwriting. Uh, writing on a tablet makes it go a bit rubbish. And then if you had like some mystery solution, then you could use this graph. You would work out the absorbance of the mystery solution, work that, and it'd be like, oh, it's 0 0.25. That's how these calibration curve type experiments work. Okay, so now it moves on to what I was about to just say. So using your calibration curve, well, what you do is you add you add a um, creatinine detecting solution to the test sample and measure its absorbance. And then what you do is you read off the um, calibration curve to use, sorry, to find the concentration. So again, let's say I made this, this graph here like this. And I get so the mystery sample has this much. I can go like this, move down, and I can say, oh, it might be like five, whatever units, you know, multiple decimeter cubed. So that that helps me work out the concentration like that. So it says, describe the sequence of events involved in transmission across a cholinergic synapse. Do not include details about the breakdown of acetylcholine in your answer. So, right, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to quickly summarize this process. We have the presynaptic neuron here, and you've got your postsynaptic membrane here. So do not, you know, don't get these mixed up. So what happens is you have your action potential here. The presynaptic membrane membrane is depolarized. So calcium ions move in. The calcium ions then cause vesicles to move across, carrying neurotransmitter to fuse with the membrane. This releases the neurotransmitter into this gap called the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter diffuses across and it binds to complementary receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, not inside the neuron, the postsynaptic membrane. This causes a type of um, sodium ion channel called ligand-gated ion channels to open, so sodium ions move in. And then obviously if a generator potential is high enough and it reaches the threshold, it triggers an action potential and impulse goes that way. That's the, essential, that's the process of how synapses work entirely. So now, obviously, we need to write it in the exam-friendly sort of way. So the presynaptic membrane... is depolarized and this causes ca2 plus to diffuse in you can say ca2 plus do not just say calcium you have to say calcium ions so that's why i recommend just saying ca2 plus diffuse into the presynaptic neuron i should say this causes vesicles containing acetylcholine. Do not abbreviate this unless the question does. So I'm going to abbreviate it here just because I'm lazy, but in the actual exam, you need to say acetylcholine in brackets ACH. So this, this causes vesicles containing ACH to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. Releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Now, like I said, with every single molecule, particle, whatever, moving in biology, say how it does. Because in this mark scheme, it says it diffuses. So the ACH diffuses across the synaptic cleft. I'm just going to cleft for short, but you write the whole thing. The ACH binds to complementary receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. I'm going to check the mark scheme after and see what this says. Postsynaptic membrane. And then, you know, then sodium ions enter the postsynaptic neuron. Leading to depolarization. 
Now I'm going to compare this with the mark scheme and see what it says. So, so here's what the mark scheme says. This is a pretty model answer for this kind of thing. Here we go. So de so depolarization of the presynaptic membrane because it's this membrane, not the inside of the cell. Calcium ions enter or CA2 plus enters. And then, you know, it causes the vesicles to fuse here and then release the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitters diffuse, like I said, across the synaptic cleft and they bind to specific receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. The sodium ions then move in in the postsynaptic neuron and then it leads to depolarization or you can get generated potential and action potential. So there's how you do that question. Mutation is one of the causes of genetic variation in organisms. What are the other, so give two other causes. The ones that I always go for are crossing over an independent segregation. You can say random fertilization as well, but I think that's a bit of a riskier uh, answer to say because some mark schemes aren't fond of it from what I've seen. So in a species of flowering plant, the T allele for tallness is dominant to the little t allele for dwarfness. In the same species, two alleles, C superscript R and C, C superscript W, code for the color of flowers. When homozygous red flowered plants were crossed with homozygous white flowered plants, the offspring had pink flowers. Why would that have happened? It is because of codominance. This is where both of the alleles are dominant. That's why with codominance we have C uh, superscript and C like that. Well, neither of them are dominant, so we can't have like you know big C little C. That doesn't work. So we have to be, call it C, you know uh, C R C W. So that's why there's that superscript notation. So next, a dwarf pink flowered plant was crossed with a heterozygous tall white flowered plant. Complete the genetic diagram to show the possible genotypes and ratio of phenotypes expected in the offspring of this cross. So let's start off by working out the genotypes. So it said in the question that little t is dwarf, if I remember correctly. Yeah, little t is dwarfness, so it's going to have to be little t, little t. So little t, little t for the dwarf part. Now, it's a pink plant, so it's got to be C superscript R, C superscript W. Now, it says it's a tall white flowered plant, and they told you it's heterozygous, so it's got to be big T, little t, C, W, C, W. So now we need to get the gametes, so you'd have T, C, R, T, C, W, T, C, R, T, C, W. They have big T, big C, W, big T, C, W, little t, C, W, little t, C, W. And you, right, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a Punnett square, a nice big one, because I like to be spaced out. T, C, R, T, C, W, T, C, R. T C W. And on the other one here we have big T C W, big T C W, little T C W, little T C W. So now put the T's together. So big T little T C R C W, big T little T C W C W, big T little T C R C W, big T little T C W C W. And then here big T little T C R C W. Big T, little t, c, w, c, w. Then uh, big T, little t, c, r, c, w. Big T, little t, c, w, c, w. Then you have little t, little t, c, r, c, w. Little t, little t, c, w, c, w. Little t, little t, c, r, c, w. Lovely process. It's little t, little t, c, w, c, w. And then we have little t, little t, c, r, c, w, little t, little t, c, w, c, w, c, w, little t, little t, c, r, c, w, little t, little t, c, w, c, w. The genotypes you get are big t, little t, c, r, c, w. You can have big t, little t, c, w, c, w. And then you can have little t, little t, c, r, c, w, little t, little t, c, w, c, w. And now we need to count up all of the ones we have. Uh, we've got, for, for this one, we've got one, two, three, four. So we've got four. And how many of these? So then we've got one, two, three, four. How many of these have we got? One, two, three, four. And then one, two, three, four. So the ratio of these are one to one to one to one. So a population of the species contains 9% of red flowered plants. Use the Hardy and Weinberg equation to calculate the percentage of pink flowered plants in this population show the working. So just as a reminder, because I've forgotten already, CR is red, CW is white. So CR, red, CW, white. Now remember that this is a co-dominant, co so you have to have 
you know, so CRMCW makes pink, CRCR makes red, CWWCW makes white. So what we, I'm going to let this one be P, this one be Q. So CR, CR is red. So that must mean that P squared equals 0.09 or 9%. So P equals the square root of that. So square root of that is 0.3. You know that P plus Q must equal 1. So therefore, Q equals 1 minus P. So that equals 0.7. So we've got P and Q sorted. They want us to find out the pink flowered plants. That's the, that's the heterozygous genotype. So you need to use this equation, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So now that we have this, 2PQ simply just equals 2 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.7, which is 0 0.42. There you go. So as a percentage, so it's going to be 42%. A scientist investigated the effects of three different fertilizers on the growth of spinach plants. They set up large samples of identical plant pots and soils. They added different masses of different fertilizers to select pots. They did not add, add fertilizer to the control plots, uh, sorry, pots. They planted the same number of young spinach plants in each pot. After 20 days, they determined the biomass of spinach plants in each plant. Sorry, spinach plants in each pot. This results are shown here. So with the control, there's not really much change because obviously no fertilizer has been applied. So that's good. That's what we want to see. Um, the chicken manure, you can see it starts to increase from 30 to 45 and it drops after. Ammonium, it's increasing, increasing, and then at 30, it sort of plateaus. And then a potassium nitrate increases, increases, and then stops. Calculate how many times greater the mean growth per day was, uh, sorry, was using 37.5 grams potassium nitrate than using 37.5 grams of ammonium sulfate. So what you do is you find the 37.5 mark. So that's 30, 45 and 30. So the middle here is going to be 37.5. So you move up the lines here and read off the graph. So we've got for the potassium nitrate, the reading is um, 4.9. And then for what is it, the ammonium, it's going to be 3.7. Now we need to work out the mean growth rate per day. So what that means is we're going to have to subtract the, we're going to have to compare the differences between them, basically. So we need to subtract the 0 0.5 from both of them, because that's the growth rate overall up to this point where the 37.5 is. And then you just divide the two. If you do that, you get 1.375, giving you the correct answer. So it says using all the information, Evaluate the effect of plant growth on adding different fertilizers. So when you get an evaluation question, let's always start off with the obvious things and then start critiquing. Imagine somebody, imagine a good way to get around this is to imagine somebody saying, all right, this must work on every single plant then. And that way that kind of gets you into the headspace of, you know, saying for and against. So with evaluate questions, your best bet is to say for and against points. So let's talk about what's going on for, you know, for and against and stuff like that. So we can see that potassium nitrate is the most effective. Chicken manure is kind of rubbish. So start off with that. Potassium nitrate, most effective chicken manure, least effective. So that in itself would be one mark because it's just what you're comparing two things. It's one statement. You're not making two statements here, you are making one. So that only counts. The next thing to do is look at the rest of the things going on. So it says to evaluate, sorry, evaluate adding the different, sorry, the evaluate the effect of plant growth on adding different fertilizers. Well, I mean, all of them were better than, you know, the control, weren't they? So there was that. So all fertilizers are more effective than the control. Can see that on the basis so always talk about what you see on the start now you know let's let's sort of critique it that's what i like to do next is i always like to try and put a criticism in they've tested it and if you watch my previous episode on um, paper one i talk about evaluation questions at the start they've only tested it on spinach plants only tested on spinach plants so it might not work on others you know you're putting these fertilizers on like i don't know bananas or something might not work also we have no statistical tests And I'm not going to write that because I'm too lazy, but we don't know if the differences are significant. Not the results are significant, the differences are significant. So one, two, three, four, we got four points off the bat simply doing that. And now we just got to find some other stuff to pick up. So let's have a look at all three of these. You can see the potassium nitrate and the ammonium nitrate plateau. So the um, potassium nitrate and ammonium nitrate, nitrates increase, plateau. 
I don't know if you spell if that's how you spell it. But yeah, after 30 grams of fertilizer added. And that in itself should be enough marks. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. Five points done off the bat. First three were, you know, the first four were quite easy to do without even having to do like much graph reading. So the scientists determined the dry mass of spinach plants. First, he heated each sample at 80 degrees Celsius for two hours. Suggest what the scientist should do to ensure he's removed all the water from the sample. All you've got to do is you just got to, you've got to heat and weigh at regular intervals and until the mass is constant. Because as you're heating it, the water is escaping, so the mass is going to decrease. Obviously, if you do it and the mass is constant, you can safely bet that all of it's, you know, all the water's gone. Alport syndrome is an inherited disorder that affects the kidney, kidney glomeruli of both men and women. Affected individuals have proteinuria, which is high quantities of protein in their urine. So just how AS causes that. So I'm going to draw a very, 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 very simplified diagram of a nephron. So you've got your PCT here, you've got your descending loop of Henle, and then you're ascending your DCT, and then yeah. This is a really rubbish diagram, but it's just to get the appreciation going on. So we've got... So it's a disorder that affects the kidney glomeruli of the men and women. So when, if you guys remember from your sort of um, re renal, sorry, kidney stuff, the only thing that gets filtered out are things like, you know, salt, sugar, water, that's it. Proteins are too big and should not be squeezed out from the high pressure into, you know, the, um, into the kidney tubule, the nephron, the nephron tubule. So what's happened is something is letting these massive proteins come out. So you need to remember about the layers in the glomerulus. Which one is it? It's the basement membrane. So what's happened is, is presumably the only way that these massive proteins can escape has to be because the basement membrane has been damaged. So damaged basement membrane. So the protein can pass into the tubule, you know, the proximal convoluted tubule and so on. That's the only explanation that really can explain why these massive proteins get out. It's the same with blood. Blood should not be able to get out into the tubule unless the um, basement membrane is damaged. AS results from a sexic mutation. In a male with AS, where would the sexic mutation be? No, 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 yes. What this, what this basically means is, so you have your sex chromosomes, your X and your Y. The homologous parts are all of these where there is a corresponding bit. With the X chromosome, because the Y chromosome is shorter, there's no homologous part here. There's nothing to mask the allele. So if you have a really rubbish recessive allele here, then there's no sort of corresponding X to mask it, so it gets expressed. That's what sex linkage is here. So it has to be the fourth one. I don't know why I crossed the fourth one out. Whoops, ignore that. Right. Scientists investigated the use of transplanted stem cells to treat AS in mice. They used four experimental groups. So they've got 40 wild type mice. Uh, that these are not affected by AS. You've got 40 AS mice, 40 AS mice that got stem cells from AS mice, and then 40 AS mice that got stem cells from wild type mice. After 20 weeks, the scientists measured the quantity of protein in urine using a scale from zero to plus plus plus, which is highest. And um, the results are shown in this table. So um, A at 20 weeks had zero, and B had quite a lot, C had quite a lot, and D had not very much, but still some. Percentage of mice with this quantity in protein. So in group A, 100% of them had no protein in their urine. In group B, 97.5 had quite a lot of protein in their urine. In group C, 100%, all of them had protein in their urine. And then in group D, 68% of them had protein in their urine, and it's not very much. So obviously in group A, they're not affected by AS, so you would expect that all of them would have none. In group B, they have AS, so you would expect that a lot of them would have it. In group C, the AS mice have received stem cells from AS mice, so you would expect that nearly all of them, if not all of them, and it's so say 100% of them would have it. And group D, you have your normal unaffected mice giving them stem cells, and you can see there's an improvement, or it suggests. So we need to evaluate again. And it says, evaluate the use of stem cells to treat AS in humans. So first off, off the bat, you can say, this has only been tested in animals, it's not been tested in humans. So tested only in mice. So we don't really know if humans would respond the same way. Why? Because, you know, we might get reje rejection may occur, which is not good. Because rejection is where your immune system recognizes it as foreign and destroys it. So let's talk about what, so evaluate means the pros and the cons. So four, well, I mean, D has lower protein than, you know, than B and C, suggesting effectiveness. 
However, it's not fully effective, is it, really? Because 68% still have a bit of protein here, whereas A has none. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not fully effective because some mice still have protein urea. And we've, we've hit the four marks, but I'm going to keep going and see what else is going on. So for ex another thing as well is that this is 68% making these two units of protein. We don't know. What about the other, um, you know, 32? The other 32 might have had all of this or none at all. So we don't know the results for the other 32%. Also, we don't know the long-term effects as well because it's only been tested for 20 weeks. 20 weeks is not that long. If I put stem cells in a human and gave them 20 weeks, something might happen down the line after, outside this time period. So those are the things that I would say off the bat. Uh, I'm going to look at what the mark scheme says. So I'm going to get that up real quick. Hold on a sec. This is question, what, 8.3? So if you have a look at the mark scheme, this is what it says. Effectively, nearly the same thing. So effective as D has lower protein than B and C. It's not fully effective because it has higher than A. So, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, okay, fine. So, you know, there's still some left. Um, you don't know the results for all the other mice in D because, you know, we only know 68%. So some of them might have had loads. Some of the mice have been cured. Some of them, we don't know the actual amount of protein because it's just pluses. Rejection may occur, is what I said. It's only been done on mice. And it only shows for 20 weeks. So that's how you tackle and evaluate question is always talking about fours, against. And, you know, has it been tested in the same thing as what the theory is? You know, in this case, mice and humans. How long has it been going on for? Are the controls in place? Are the statistical tests? And all of that kind of stuff. The scientists carried out further work to investigate how the transplanted cells developed after transplantation. The scientists transplanted stem cells from the wild-type male mice into AS female mice. After 20 weeks, they found the quantity of protein in the urine of these female mice had significantly decreased. They examined cells from the glomeruli of the female mice. Some of these cells contained a Y chromosome. So suggest how the transplanted cells reduce proteinuria. So they've got wild as in unaffected male mice, and they put these into female mice. Because they have a Y chromosome, it must mean that the glomeruli have these male unaffected cells doing something in them. So how do they work? Well, it must be that the transplanted stem cells must have done their job. So they transplanted stem cells, they differentiate, or you can use the word specialized, you know, into, uh, sorry, and they reduce protein loss at the glomerulus. Glomerulus at the glomerulus. And that's how they work, because, you know, because they have a Y chromosome, that must mean that some of them are doing their job, they're working, because they got them from male mice. So, a scientist produced transgenic zebrafish. They obtained the gene from a silver, silver side fish, the gene codes for growth hormone. She inserted the copies of the GH gene into plasmids. She then microinjected these recombinant plasmids into the fertilized eggs of zebrafish. Describe how enzymes can be used to insert the gene into a plasmid. This is where we use restriction endonucleases. So we're not, we're inserting this gene. So we have this gene here and we want to insert it into this plasmid. We are not cutting the gene. The gene has already been cut. So this is a common mistake people make is that they read restriction endonuclease saying, all right, we're cutting out the gene. No, we want to stick it into the plasmid. Use, sorry, whoops, use restriction endonucleases to cut the plasmid to produce sticky ends. Because if you cut the plasmid, you're left with those sticky ends that have complementary base pairs to the gene fragment you want to put in. And add DNA ligase. to join the DNA fragment to the sticky ends. Microinjection of DNA into fertilized egg cells is a frequent method of producing transgenic fish. However, the insertion of the transfer gene into de nuclear DNA may be delayed. Consequently, the offspring of transgenic fish may not possess the desired characteristics. Suggest and explain how delayed insertion of the GH gene could produce offspring of transgenic fish without it. So we're looking at talking about offspring of the transgenic fish without the desired characteristic. So if I have a fish, like a fish parent, and I put the gene into it, then when it becomes a full-blown fish, it will have every single cell in the body will have that gene in it. So, you know, if it makes gametes and sperm and whatever, it will have that gene that I want. However, if I already have, like, you know, a pretty well-developed fish, you know, a bunch of cells or whatever, and I add the gene into it, then this gene might not be present in the gametes, you know? It might, some of the fish will have it, some of it won't. It's a concept called mosaicism for those who want to go a bit further. So, what we've done is we've made this thing that's got a mishmash of some cells with it and some that don't. So what's happened here is cell division 
whoops, happened before the gene is except before the gene is inserted. And then what's the consequence of it? Well, the gametes produced don't have the gene. Because if you add it too late before all the gametes, you know, the gamete producing cells are made, it's not going to have that gene. Whereas if you put it in to start with, then every single cell in the body, including the gametes, will have that gene. The scientists investigated whether the transferred, the transferred GH gene increased the growth of transgenic zebrafish. She microinjected 2,000 fertilized egg cells with the GH plasmid and left 2,000 fertilized egg cells untreated. After 12 months, she determined the mean mass of the transgenic, transgenic and non-transgenic fish. The results are shown in this table. A value of two times the standard deviation from the mean includes over 95% of the data. So a type of zebrafish, transgenic, non-transgenic, and we have the mean mass here, and we've got 1.79 plus or minus 0 0.37 and 0 0.68. First thing with any standard deviation is to check, are there any overlaps? So just simply type it into your calculator. You would do 1.79 minus 0 0.37, that gives you 1.42, and then 0 0.68 minus, sorry, plus one, 0 0.13, it gives you 0 0.81, so there's no overlap in the data. Using table three, what can you conclude about the effectiveness? Well, first of all, there's no overlap in SDs. So there's a significant difference in mass. You cannot just say the results are significant or the results are not due to chance. That's a load of BS. You need to say what specifically is significant and what specifically is not due to chance. It is the increase or the difference in mass that is not due to chance. You need to, need to, need to say that. Explain how two features of the design of this investigation can ensure, help to ensure the validity of the result conclusions obtained. Do not include calculating the mean or SD. So, what, I mean, obviously one big thing is using a large sample size. So, use a large sample size. But why? You need to say why. So the results are representative. Again, it's like saying, it's like you asking me, hey Ish, why is having a car good? And I say it's got four wheels. It doesn't tell me why it's good. You need to say you, the, the, the one mark comes from something, so something. And that's a general thing in biology people screw up, is you need to say something and then therefore something. So large sample size, therefore it's representative. You could also say control, sorry, use a control group to allow comparison so you can compare. There's no point in having like, you know, these fish and growing them and being like, oh, they're getting pretty big when you don't have a baseline to compare them to. As well as that, you could also say use a very long time frame, for example, like, you know, 12 months or whatever, so you can actually allow them to grow fully. So if I did it for two weeks, they might grow like, you know, they might grow loads, but then they might stop growing and some might grow faster. So it's 12 months or longer, or, you know, some of the time frame would be good to allow to, you know, to actually see the effects of the growth. Okay, so for this one, I'm just going to cut out me reading it from the video because it just saves time. I will go through this question. Now, shockingly, you know, if it says read the following passage, it's a good idea to read the damn passage. Also, another pointer as well is when it says lines one to two, don't just look at lines one to two and be like, oh, I can't find the answer, mate. Where is it? Don't do that. Look around the, look around the lines one to two. Look before and after. You'd be surprised to see how many pupils I see that read it, read, read specifically lines one and two and be like, oh, man, shit, man, I, I can't see the answer. I don't know why. And then I show them and I tell them to read the whole, th I read, read around it. They read the whole passage and like, oh, my God, there it is. So black bears can hibernate up to seven months without food or water, lines one to two, so just explain how. So, wow, let's look at lines one to two. So North American black bears can hibernate up to seven months without food or water. The bears survive using the fat stores in their bodies. There's a hint right there! The bears build up the fat stores during the summer. During hibernation, the heart rates decreases from a summer mean of 55 to 14. The metabolic rate falls by 75. You've got all your answers right there! So, how can they hibernate? Well, they use the fat stores, don't they? So they use the fat stores used in respiration to release energy. What else? Well, it says that their heart rate stops and they start moving and their metabolic rate drops. So obviously there's a, the demand is lower. So the energy, energy demand is lower due to reduced metabolism. What else can we say? Well, uh, Okay, so suggest now is obviously you need to try and suggest something. So, you know, a fat bear isn't going to have a very high surface area to volume ratio. So low surface area to volume ratio 
therefore less heat loss. What else could you say? Um, without food or water. So what? So it's testing you and your knowledge of what ad adaptations things can have to reduce water. Well, they might be you know urinating less. They might evaporate less through like less sweating. Um, they also what else can they do? They might have long loops of Henley so that less water is lost. So there's things you can say as well. But just simply by reading around the lines, you can get the answers pretty easily, or you know clues. Next. So during hibernation, the heart rate and metabolic rates decrease. Use your knowledge of the nervous control, sorry, the nervous control of heart rate to explain how these are linked. So I'm going to move this over here just so I can read this again. So again, like everything, we read lines three to five. So I'm going to look at three to five. The best bit of the fat stores during hibernation, the heart rate decreases and the metabolic rate falls. So we need to talk about why the metabolic rate is decreasing and the heart rate as, as well. So we need to look back onto the nervous control of heart rate. So we need to... Whenever describing anything to do with like the control of heart rate or any nervous thing, to be honest, you need to talk about the receptor. You need to talk about the central, you know, the CNS or the processing, where the processing actually happens. What pathway is being used? Is it parasympathetic or nervous? Sorry, parasympathetic or sympathetic? And we need to talk about the effector and the end result. Okay, so we're clearly talking about, you know, we're, we're clearly talking about um, reduced heart rate. So obviously the heart rate is lower. What's the effector of that? Well, the uh, sinoatrial node controls the heart rate. So obviously that's being affected. If we're going to decrease the heart rate, what pathway are we going to be using? We're going to use parasympathetic. Parasympathetic f is peaceful. Sympathetic is fight or flight. So I'm going to write PNS for short, but you, you guys write parasympathetic. CNS, what part of the brain or whatever controls these impulses? Well, it's the medulla. And then what detects the change? So we need to sort of figure out what the receptor is, what's picking up the change that's leading to this. Well, if they're metabolizing less, then that means there's going to be less CO2, isn't there? So the chemoreceptors are going to pick this up. And you can, you can straight up just make your answer from that easy peasy. So lower metabolism means less CO2 detected by chemoreceptors. They send impulses to the medulla, and then the medulla sends impulses via the um, parasympathetic nervous system. Actually, sorry, it's, they send fewer impulses. I should say fewer impulses. They send uh, they send impulses to the par sorry via, uh, sorry via the parasympathetic nervous system to the SAN. And the SAN reduces its firing rate. Impulse firing rate. If you follow this approach, it will always be fine. Every single time. Always talk about the receptor, what's detecting the change, what's processing this information, what pathway is the, the result, resulting effect being sent on. Is it the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system? What's actually carrying out the end effect? Is it the sinoatrial node? And then obviously the end result. And obviously you work backwards or forwards, whichever way you need to go. Right. In many mammals, uncoupling proteins help maintain a constant body temperature in line six to seven. Suggest how? So if we go to line six and seven, what's going on here? So in many mammals, uncoupling proteins help to maintain a constant body temperature during hibernation. Uncoupling proteins are found in the inner mitochondrial membrane and act as proton channels during chemiosmosis, but they do not generate ATP. So you've got your, you've, again, reading around it gives you your hints. So the movement in, in chemiosmosis, what happens is the movement of those proteins the energy from that is then used to generate ATP. So if it's not going to ATP, it has to go somewhere else. Energy needs to go somewhere else. So these coupling proteins, they allow the passage of H+, the movement of them. So where does it go? Well, the energy has to be released as heat instead of being used to form ATP. Next. So climatic changes reduce the survival of snowshoe hair in mount snowshoe hares in mountain habitat suggest and explain how. So let me just move this passage. So in the mountains of North America, the winter changes into spring. The coat of snowshoe hares changes from white to brown. Climatic changes has caused the snow to melt earlier. This has reduced the survival rate of snowshoe hair in these habitats. The change in coat color. So the change in coat color occurs when new fur replaces old fur. This is called molting. Recent research has shown that snowshoe hares within a population molt at different times. Molting at different times can be a major factor in ensuring the survival of snowshoe hare populations. Obviously, if there's less snow earlier, there's going to be less camouflage, isn't there? Because they're not, they haven't molted yet. If they're not camouflaged, they're going to get scrammed by predators. So they're most likely, more, sorry, more likely 
to be killed and eaten by predators. You know, why would they be white in the snow? Like, it's camouflage. So next. Snowshoe hares within a population multi different times. I've, I've already read this part. Explain how this can ensure the survival of snowshoe hare populations in these mountain habitats. So if the snow is melting earlier, then, you know, we want, ideally, the hares that molt earlier and change, you know, the color of their fur are going to mo be more likely to survive. Because previously, we just said that the ones that are, you know, white and molt later are going to die. So if those ones are more likely to survive, they're going to pass on the alleles that, contr that contribute to their mol molting happening earlier, and that leads to increased survival of their offspring and so on, and over generations, more of this allele spread, spread and spread and spread until the allele frequency increases. So that's, now we need to put this in. So hairs that molt earlier are more likely to survive and reproduce. They pass, they pass on advantageous alleles for earlier molting. You can't, you need to, ideally, you need to say why, you know, what the advantageous allele actually is. And then over time, over generations, the allele frequency increases in offspring. The allele, so in this type of question where it's a sort of like survival thing, it's usually a case of some, some, some organism has an increased, you know, some sort of adaptation that makes them more likely to survive and reproduce then that means they pass on this advantage and advantageous allele. That means more of the offspring have this allele. And that means that that frequency of the allele, how often it appears in the gene pool, increases. You cannot, you know, pass that allele on if you don't survive and if you don't reproduce. So there's that. Anyway, that wraps up this paper. I hope it was helpful. Um, if you have any questions or want me to do videos on anything, let me know and put it in the comments. And yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.